Violence never truly solves anything, except in video games when it solves everything. Except in the handful of special occasions that call for non-violent lateral thinking. Recently, we reminisced about the times when violence wasn't the answer, and you came right back at us with lots of non-violent nostalgia of your own, recalling the times you used your sneaky ways and pacifist tendencies to resolve a conflict. Thanks for all your terrific suggestions, and now get comfy for these further times that non-violence was the answer, and the question was, how do I not die? You see, there's this spotted white. It haunts an abandoned residence in the Caraberta woods. Impossible. My brethren hunted down every last spotted white before I was born. Then it seems you must revise your knowledge of spotted whites. For somehow this one managed to survive your brethren's onslaught. As they used to say at my Swiss finishing school, proper dinner etiquette will take you a long way, Jane. Now pick up your oyster fork. No, Jane, that's a salad fork. They're all forks. But whether you're trying to impress a minor royal or not be torn limb from limb by a ravening ghoul, good manners at the dinner table turn out to be just the thing. At least they do in the Witcher 3 expansion, Blood and Wine. Hmm. Actually does seem like a white's lair. Bit atypical, but still. Cauldron should be somewhere around here. Yes, in one quest in Blood and Wine, you track a gruesome creature known as a spotted white to its lair, where it has been tormenting locals and also, apparently, hoarding spoons? Spoon. Pretty ordinary. Maybe a little old. I mean, sure, we all love spoons. Like this! Soup? Spoon? Try again. Table? Spoon? No. They're all spoons. White's obsessed. A real collector. Then, when the gross spoon-loving monster returns to its lair, you have a choice, as noted by commenter Camilo Gonzalez, who says, Having dinner with a spotted white in Witcher 3. Just sit down and have a civilised meal. No fighting at the table. Ha! That's right, you can either leap from your heroic hiding place and attack your host in their own home, which, rude, or you can sit down like a gentleman and have a nice dinner with them. Because as a well-mannered witcher who knows a tricksy curse when he sees one, you know the best way out of this fine dining fandango is to share a meal with the creature and, crucially, use the correct cutlery. Which, in this case, is no cutlery at all. We can't use spoons. No, that won't work. You've been looking for a spoon that would feed you, but there's no such spoon. We need to eat without spoons. What? No spoons? I give up! By supping spoonlessly, you lift the curse on your dinner companion, who is magicked back into human form with nary a bloody and impolite sword fight over the dining table. I'll take you someplace safe. Dessert spoon! That's a teaspoon. I'm pretty sure I could eat dessert with this. Why are you even paying for that Swiss finishing school? Well, go on, take the bloody bag off his head. Again, terribly sorry for what happened before. This is more what I had in mind. So, fresh start, introductions. RJ Gale, our guest of honor. Paul, our very gracious host. The little monkey, whose name I still don't know. And I, of course, am Pagan Min. Speaking of dining with the enemy, you can sidestep so much violent bloodshed in Far Cry 4 just with a spot of being a good guest. It's almost worth eating crab. Stay right here. Enjoy the crab rangoon. Don't move. I will be right back. Have you seen crabs? They're like angry red sideways spider aliens. Ugh. I say it's worth eating crab, but actually you never do get around to chowing down on the ocean's freakiest food stuff. As commenter M. Mitchell suggests, uh, Far Cry? Just be a decent dinner guest. That's right, if by being a decent dinner guest, you mean patiently sit and wait while your host excuses himself to go and suppress a local uprising, which we do. Right at the beginning of the game, you get taken captive by the tyrannical pagan Min and forced to sit at his table while he gets his villainy on. Did no one ever teach you that it's rude to text at the table? Let's see here. It means fun. Really, guys, we're not checking for these anymore? But after your kidnapper slopes off to oversee a spot of brutal torture, you can disregard your instinct to escape his palatial compound and get on with the game, and instead stick around in the dining room. And although you never actually do sample the delicacies you've been served, your polite patience is good enough for Pagan Min. Oh, fan-bloody-tastic. You, sir, are a gentleman. I 
sincerely apologize. We saw terrorists in the area and yada yada. The Crab Rangoon, right? It's... <laughs> Fabulous. I actually d don't know. I haven't tried it yet because crabs look like angry red sideways spider aliens. Well, come on, let's go. Whew, that was close. In no time at all, your grateful host helicopters you to the game's final objective, where you fulfill your mother's last wish without a single drop of blood spilled, except from that guy who got stabbed over dinner. Maybe now we can finally shoot some goddamn guns. Yes, that's it. Mission complete, game over. Kirat is still oppressed, but mum's happy, no shots fired, and I didn't have to eat crap. Hey, wait, what's going on? Where is everybody? Those weird monsters? They have come to witness the beginning. The rebirth of paradise, despoiled by mankind. What are you talking about? Gods come in all shapes and sizes. The Hindu god Ganesha has four arms and the head of an elephant. The Egyptian goddess Tauret has the head of a hippo, the arms and legs of a lion, and the tail of a crocodile. And the god of the new religion I just founded is Tim Curry. Space! No further questions. In Silent Hill 3, there's a god who's about to be born, and this being Silent Hill, it's in the shape of a horrifying half-skeleton monster woman. Always with the horrifying women, Silent Hill. Could it not have just been a teddy bear with the face of a kitten this time? Worse still, it appears that for the majority of the game, the heroine, a teenage girl called Heather, is carrying around the weird, gross fetus of that god inside her, causing her no end of stomach complaints. It's growing within you. I'm not saying the whole god fetus thing is unlikely, but have we definitely ruled out acid indigestion? Further complicating matters is a cultist called Claudia who is busy trying to accelerate the whole process by winding Heather up, because the god fetus apparently is nurtured by hatred. You despise me, don't you? You're damn right I do! That's good. I can think of a few tabloid columnists that might be attempting the same thing. The game ends with a confrontation in a chapel and your immediate temptation might be to shoot Claudia in her big dumb face. That's a bad move though, because it's an expression of hatred, as commenter Harris Hoyne identified. If you attack Claudia, then the evil god inside you is born and you get a game over. Instead, you have to get rid of it with the magic medicine that was conveniently in your locket all along. Yay, horror games. Always check the locket. Refuse to attack Claudia and Heather will swallow the cure she's apparently been carrying around in her pendant for the whole game, causing her to throw up the fetus right there onto the chapel floor. <laughs> Thinking on her feet, Claudia then swallows the fetus in order to give birth to it herself. Claudia! I think someone needs to have the talk with the developers of Silent Hill 3. Now, when a mummy and a daddy love each other very much... Stop! Look, just ask your parents. Still, to be fair, violence definitely does become the answer shortly afterwards, with you not only killing the god, but then booting it several times in the head for good measure. So yes, violence was sort of the answer, but it was more of a multi-part question. One of us thou art not. One place you're not expecting to find a non-violent solution is in Dark Souls, where the rule is do violence unto others before they do violence unto you. Or at least do violence to others after they've done a violence on you and you've come back and collected all your souls and had another go. When you journey into the painted world of Aramis, however, you encounter crossbreed Priscilla, a half-dragon lady with more white fur than a two-story Easter bunny. If thou seekest I, thine desires shall be requited. 
did not. And as commenter McJethro Povty reminds us, I was hoping Luke's experience with Priscilla in Dark Souls would make it here. Oh, that's right, Luke murdered her, didn't he? What a monster. And you can hear all about it in this video right here. Anywho, it turns out that Priscilla is one of the few bosses in the whole game you don't have to kill. When you meet Priscilla in this Colosseum looking arena, obviously you're thinking, here we go, time to clobber another boss, or in our case, get clobbered by one. But then she tells you if you want to get back to the real world, you only need to hurl yourself off the ledge over there. If thou hast misstepped into this world, plunge down from the plank and hurry home. Alternatively, if you're like our good friend Luke of Outside Extra, you can lash mindlessly out at this non-hostile character, forcing poor old Priscilla to defend herself. I expected as much from thee. Why dost thou hurry toward thine death? Which proves once and for all that the real monster is you. And also all the monsters. Oh, oh, but why? Yeah, Luke, what dost seekest thee? Thou. Whatever. A doppelganger is supposedly a supernatural exact likeness of a person, often considered to be evil and or a harbinger of bad luck. There's nothing in the dictionary I'm reading about them also being a fleshy, skinless nightmare who mimics your every move, but what do books know? Books! Pfft. This one doesn't even have any pictures! Tomb Raider, on the other hand, posits the existence of a kind of Lara Croft doppelganger created with ancient science magic, who looks kind of like Lara Croft if she were wearing a Lady Gaga-esque bacon bodysuit. Now I know what you're thinking. This is exactly the kind of shootable problem for which Lara's twin pistols were invented. However, it's just like commenter Eagle219406 says. Lara encounters the skinless doppelganger at Natla's Island. It turns out, however, it is harmless unless Lara attacks it. If she does, the doppelganger reflects back a huge bolt of energy at Lara. It seems all it does is mimic Lara's moves in the opposite direction. Indeed, shooting bacon Lara is a bad and ineffective idea. Instead, you're going to have to muster all your non-violent puzzling skills into platforming yourself into position to pull levers and manipulate this musculature model into voluntarily leaping into a fiery pit. Duh! <laughs> yeah. Man, I was going to say, what smells like frying bacon? But then you had to go and scream and ruin it. Now it's not fun. Talk about being your own worst enemy. Lara, please! Sorry, Threepwood. As much as I'd love to be out at sea again, I could never serve a captain who wasn't a gentleman and who wasn't my equal. I'm at least two times your equal. Then prove it. If you can defeat me in a gentleman's duel, I'll join your crew. As anyone who's seen Hamilton will tell you, dueling used to be the way that people dealt with any kind of social folks pass. It's faux pas. That's it! Pistols at dawn! It also appears to be the only way to convince the elegant pirate Edward Van Helgen to join your crew in the Curse of Monkey Island, as pointed out by commenter Shabomo, who says, Monkey Island 3, where you have to go for a banjo duel instead of a pistol duel. And you later take the pistol anyway, since your opponent is just so darn good at playing the banjo. That's right, I'm getting Monkey Island into another list, and you can't complain because it's a commenter suggestion, so my hands are clean. Van Helgen is not super keen to join your pirate crew because he just doesn't think you have what it takes to be a great pirate. Which, considering that up to this point, you've stolen pretty much everything you've come across that isn't nailed down, is pretty unfair. Anyway, this is the past, and as such, social barbs like this cannot go unanswered. Which is why what you need to do next is slap Van Helgen in the face with a glove and challenge him to a duel. Now there's a challenge! To the field of honour! Arriving at the Field of Honor, you are given your choice of weapon from a fine selection of dueling pistols. Choosing a firearm, however, always leads to you losing. Van Helgen is, in his own words, the greatest duelist in the world and can shoot your gun out of your hand every time. Ah! Again I prove to you I'm the greatest duelist in the world! The only solution is to reject the tools of violence and instead embrace the tools of art and creativity. Or, since those aren't available, one of these! Now the contest becomes a lot more even, as it turns out that Van Helgen is a match for his close namesake Eddie Van Halen in the banjo stakes, and surprisingly, so is Guybrush. 
All you have to do is follow Edward's playing, which is much simpler than trying to shoot him accurately with a 17th century flintlock pistol. Look, I take it back, can we just go back to shooting each other? It turns out we can, because no matter how good you are, Edward is always better. Unless you go right back to embracing violence again, and shoot his banjo to death. What? You shot my banjo? Of all the low-down tricks, I never heard of anything so low. You are a pirate after all. I'd be proud to join your crew. Truly, once again, we have learned that the non-violent path is the correct one. Unless it doesn't work, in which case you should go straight back to violence. Man, lessons are hard. Until Dawn's one of those games where if you don't react quickly, extremely bad things can happen. Like when you accidentally slip off a pipe ten minutes ago and your girlfriend gets her jaw ripped off. No! All the time you fail to grab your girlfriend as she hangs over the edge of a chasm and receive a stern telling off. You know, I'm... I'm lucky to be alive. No thanks to you. Jeez, Em, I, I tried to grab you. <laughs> Good effort, Matt. I'll do better next time, man. I promise. You know, it's worse because she's not angry, she's just disappointed. The point is, the game conditions you to react to QTEs quickly and basically without thinking too hard. Which is fine, just as long as the game doesn't switch up the rules on you. Which is obviously exactly what it does during the part of the game set in an abandoned sanatorium. In this section of the game, you play as sexy teen number three, Mike, who I personally think is giving Mike's a bad name by being the annoying one in every horror story who thinks that a jump scare prank is hilarious. What do you think? Ah! Oh, Jesus! <laughs> yeah, intelligent, driven, persuasive, and super basic. And no, I didn't jump, actually. You jumped. Open the door to the sanatorium and a ferocious wolf will leap out at you, prompting a QTE. React to that QTE and you boot the wolf square in the face. If only Red Riding Hood had thought of that. Wolf kicking is somehow the wrong course of action though, as commenter Mark Liddell points out. Until dawn, as Mike, don't kick the angry wolf who bursts out at you in the chapel and he'll become your friend, with the possibility of heroically sacrificing himself for you later in the game. Yes, if you resist the urge to hoof the wolf in the snout, he becomes your bestest pal, accompanying you for the rest of your journey through the sanatorium. Hey, big guy. Can they see me again, huh? Hey. I was hoping I'd run into you again. He'll even leap in front of your gross cannibal enemy if you're too slow on a QTE. Look on the bright side though, although you messed up a QTE and the wolf died, at least you can say you didn't kick an innocent animal in the face. Unless you messed up that QTE as well. You monster. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you come in. Uh, thanks for watching this video about the times that non-violence was the answer. Your suggestions, some excellent ones there. Thanks for those. Uh, if you want to watch more from us up here, we've got a video about uh, jokes we didn't get until much later in video games. It just went straight over our head because uh, it was a rude joke or a reference we didn't get. Down here is a video from Outside Extra, which is the one I was talking about earlier with Luke, uh, where he did the terrible thing in Dark Souls. It's about decisions we regretted in games. So check that out as well, and we'll see you next time.